the year is 2020. A large technology conglomerate is building the next generation of bioengineered humans for use off-world, known as uh, replications. The project is performing well, sprint velocity is high, OKRs are on track, and recent health monitors identified zero miscalibration incidents. The CTO has personally tasked you, a JIRA admin, with integrating JIRA Cloud with their internal time tracking service. You build this with Atlassian Connect. The great thing about Connect is that it lets professional app developers work with a huge amount of control and flexibility. When you're looking to build something that needs to support hundreds of thousands of users with a huge range of use cases, making decisions about your own stack is absolutely critical. But when you're building an app for just your team, you don't want the same control and the same decisions that a pro developer is making. That's stuff like, how am I going to host it locally? Do I use Ngrok or do I use AWS? What about remotely? Should I use AWS, GCP, Azure, Linode, or do I just host it myself on-prem? What language should I use? What framework should I use with that language? Then I should decide on a code style guide, right? And then a version control system. And why not? How I'm going to name my branches and my commits and my PRs. And then I also need a front-end framework. So is that React or Angular or Vue? And a component library. Should I use AUI, Atlas Kit, the reduced UI pack? Or should I just roll my own based on the design guidelines? Then I need a styling library to go with it. So is that a motion or should I use styled components and a CSS preprocessor to use with them? And then I should also decide what JavaScript variant I'd like. I mean, TypeScript looks great, but so are Flow and Reason. And this blog over here is telling me that vanilla JS and JS dot can suffice. Then I want a bundler. So I should probably pick between Rollup, Webpack or Parcel. And a package manager. I mean, Yarn V2 is hot right now, or do I pick Yarn V1 or do I pick NPM? And then I should decide what browsers to support and how I'm going to polyfill them. And once I get through all of that, I should decide how to host the front end. Is that Express or Coa or, I don't know, Gatsby? And all of this is before I decide on my instrumentation pipeline and testing, which inevitably has three or four of its own components. And the CTO looks at your three-week turnaround and AWS budget asks, what happens next isn't called execution. It's called retirement. Developers on small teams tell us that they simply don't have the time to agonize over how they're going to build their stack out. They don't have the time to worry about security. They don't have the resources or the budget to self-host. These are all things we built out in Connect because they've let our vendors cultivate the vibrant ecosystem of apps that help our users get the job done. For the rest of us, I'm really excited to share today. Forge UI is your new utopia. In this session, I'm going to run through what it's like and how it's got you covered. Kang will follow up with how it works and how easy it is to build a Forge UI app. And I'll finish up by telling you how to get started today. One of the biggest strengths of Atlassian's product suite is that teams have built over 28,000 apps for their own Atlassian instances. That's 87% of all apps, private, custom integrations that sit inside companies to help you bring our products to meet your needs. The main thing Kang and I want you to take away today is that we handle all the complexities for you. Forge UI has got you covered. In a traditional presentation, I'd go through all the new things you have to spend the next two months frantically trying to either implement or mitigate. But instead, let's chat about all the things that Forge UI doesn't have, all the things that you don't have to worry about anymore. These fall under design, the frameworks you're using to build your apps, and trust. If your apps are hard to use or don't work like you expect them to, your users will simply opt to not use them. Designers spend years learning how to make important decisions that help your users understand your apps. But hardly any Atlassian admins have the budget and the mandate to employ a designer. For example, you want your apps to be consistent with the outside UI so that users trust it. And you want your forms and inputs to make sense so that you don't confuse them. Oh, and you definitely don't want to spend hours in dependency hell every time we release a new UI patch. 
Instead of you having to agonize over making sure your apps are well-designed and visually up-to-date, Forge UI does it all for you. Let me be clear, what you're seeing on the left of your screen right now is real Forge UI code, and Kang is going to go deeper on how it works a bit later. But for now, all you have to do is tell us what inputs you need and what to call them, and we'll do everything else on the visual side. You can rest easy knowing our designers have put the hard work into making sure your users will be able to navigate your app. When we showed Forge UI to one of our consultants at Atlas Camp last year, they made it clear that they just got to focus on the code they had to write. That with Forge UI, it's all about the business logic of the app and not the peripheral design and framework decisions. Let's move on to chatting about all the frameworks you don't need to think about when you're using Forge UI. We chatted to an experienced Atlassian developer about Connect, and one of the first things they said to us is that for even a really small change to our products, you have to run all your own infrastructure. We're offering three major quality of life improvements where we take responsibility for how the front of the app works behind the scenes. First, we host everything. That means you don't have to worry about reliability, connecting the front-end hosting to the back-end hosting, and best of all, no more 3am pages. Once it's up and running, it's our responsibility, and you get to rest easy knowing that we've got it from here. Second, no more fights about languages, frameworks, bundlers, resolvers, packages, optimizers, stylers, pipelines, or renderers. We've made all the hard decisions, and we've come up with a front-end stack that's easy to get cracking with. You just need to think about what you'd like to build. Finally, it's all natively executed. We render everything directly into the product. That's no more iframes. It's responsive, it matches the products it's sitting in, and it feeds into our trust story. A cloud architect who's worked on Atlassian solutions for hundreds of companies explained to us how easy it's going to make their job. You don't have to maintain it, because it just maintains itself. Let's move on to talking about how, from an explicitly front-end perspective, Forge UI can save you from issues around security, privacy, and trust. Since we're hosting the front end, nothing leaves your cloud instance without your permission. Malicious app creators can only track what you do and send data outside your cloud if you explicitly grant them that option. That also means no cross-site scripting or tricking people into giving up their data. All this ties into our design story. Users trust Atlassian products, and with your consistent native experience, they're going to immediately trust you too. There's no need to build that relationship by auditing each individual developer anymore. All they have to trust is us. Enough from me. Kang is here to explain what it looks like, how easy it is to get started, and what it does under the hood. Thanks, Hugh. Hi, I'm Kang. As part of the engineering team that created Forge UI, I'm really excited to show you all the work that our team has done to make creating useful user experiences easy for you. My aim for today is to guide you through how easy it is to create a realistically useful Forge UI app, and on the way to help you to understand what the Forge UI framework does behind the scenes for you. We'll be creating a Forge UI confluence macro that accepts some feedback from the user and creates a JIRA issue. It's a pretty simple app. We've unlocked use cases more complex than this with Forge UI, but for the purposes of this presentation, this app is a good blend of simplicity and utility. In fact, we've already been using this app in our Confluence pages within Atlassian as we gather feedback internally. My hope is that this app and presentation can inspire you to think of ways that you could use Forge UI to improve your team's workflow. Now, before we start building this app, there are a few underlying concepts that I think would be helpful to get a better understanding of Forge UI. The first thing to know about Forge UI is that our app code will be run in a serverless function. This architecture is often referred to as functions as a service or FAS and includes services such as Amazon Web Services Lambda function. Forge UI apps benefit from the scalability and manageability of serverless functions. There's no need to scrutinize over how to most cost-effectively and reliably host and deploy apps, or to worry about whether the infrastructure can handle the load that it receives. Instead, we simply upload our code to the cloud, 
and the functions can scale up to handle as many requests as we need. Atlassian managed infrastructure also means that users can more easily trust the security of their data. This diagram here represents what happens when an Atlassian user activates an app, for example viewing a JIRA issue with the app displayed in the side panel. The function gets invoked by the user's device, and our app code is run in the function as orchestrated by the Forge UI framework. The function returns the app's UI to the user's device to then be displayed on their screen. But how exactly do we communicate to the user's device what should be displayed? Well, first let me explain that Forge UI is a declarative way to build user experiences. What that means is that Forge UI is a way to communicate what should be on the screen, not how it should appear. We want our app code to be able to return some sort of intermediary data format that tells the user's device to display, for example, a form with a text field inside of it. So we've decided to use a markup language, which is a subset of JSON. An app's UI is represented by a tree of JSON objects, with a type property determining which Forge UI element to display, and other specified properties to alter what each component looks like and what content it includes. But don't worry, we're not going to make you write your UI in JSON. Instead, we've abstracted this markup away by introducing the function component syntax. An app now takes the form of a JavaScript function which returns UI in a recognizable HTML-like syntax. In fact, this syntax might look quite familiar to some of you. That's because Forge UI was inspired by the same JSX and function component concepts that have been popularized by React in recent years. The combination of these concepts allows us to write our UI in a familiar way, with auto-completion of component names and props already supported in many code editors. Business logic can be modularized into reusable components, increasing the maintainability and readability of our code. We found that this syntax was a great fit for Forge UI, and also supports additional powerful features such as local state, which I'll delve into a bit later. Now that we've got an idea of the serverless architecture of Forge UI, and the concepts that Forge UI introduces to make building apps easy, why don't we take a look at what that looks like in our real-world feedback collector example. This is a Forge UI app. At the bottom of the code snippet, and conceptually surrounding all of the rest of the app code, is the Forge UI render function. The purpose of the render function is to orchestrate all the work that the Forge UI framework does behind the scenes, abstracting it away to enable app developers to focus on the logic that really matters to them. At its simplest, the render function can be thought of as what transforms the function components that we write into the markup that we send back to the user's device. In this code snippet, the render function wraps the Forge UI macro component which informs the framework of our intention for this app to be a confluence macro. Above that last line, we can see the function that we as the app developer write to define our app's UI. But at what point does this code get run, and how does that translate into the user seeing an interface on the screen? When a user visits a location that contains the Forge UI app, such as a confluence page with our feedback collector app on it, the first thing that occurs is that the serverless function with our app code is invoked. I'm going to be using this diagram style quite generously in this presentation, as I found it quite helpful for visualizing what's happening. The top half here refers to work being done on the user's device, such as their browser, while the bottom half represents work done in the serverless function. We're using this orange arrow to denote when the serverless function is called by the user's device. You can see that the first thing that happens is that the user's device invokes the serverless function. Within the serverless function execution, our app code runs. The function component we wrote is translated on the fly into the markup. Again, it's mostly the render function in combination with JSX, which is able to convert the function component into the corresponding markup. This markup is then returned from the function and sent back to the user's device. And finally, this markup is transformed into native components on the user's device. In the browser, this markup is transformed into React components. All of this is abstracted away to become one simple piece of code written in a familiar, easy-to-use syntax.
The power of this declarative way of defining user interfaces is especially evident, as Hugh touched on earlier, when we realise that we don't need to worry about whether our app looks Atlassian-y enough or how the app will look in different contexts. Forge UI will make sure that it looks right, works well, and follows the Atlassian design guidelines, meaning that you'll benefit from the design trust and accessibility of the components without needing to worry about constantly upgrading anything. So at this point in the presentation, we've displayed our feedback collector app successfully. It has a text field and a form which comes with a submit button. But we haven't yet talked about what happens when we hit that submit button. Events in Forge UI are interactions by the user that correspond with an event handler within the app code. So far we've seen how Forge UI enables you to render components onto the user's page, but events allow Forge UI apps to be interacted with. For example, taking a look back at our feedback collector code from before, we know that the form component we used comes with a submit button, but we haven't yet defined what happens when the form is submitted. As I mentioned before, each event corresponds to an event handler. An event handler is simply a function which will be run when that event occurs. So, in our feedback collector app, we need an event handler to be run when the event of the user submitting the form occurs. In our code, this looks like a handle submit function, which is passed into the onSubmit property of the form component. When I click on the submit button, this handle submit function will be run. This doesn't change much about what happens when the user first views the app. We still invoke the serverless function in the same way, running the app code and returning markup, and we still transform the markup and display the app natively. But when the user clicks the submit button, what happens is that the app is invoked a second time. Specifically, we invoke the serverless function with data that uniquely identifies the corresponding event handler. When the app code is executed, the render function recognises by the data passed in that the onSubmit event handler on the form component needs to be run. In this case, our handle submit function takes in form data as well, also passed in from the user's device when the form was submitted. Within handle submit, we can use the forge API to deal with the previously time-consuming and finicky process of authentication for us. I've abstracted away the boring details of the exact API request body, but what it does is that it takes the feedback that was input by the user into the text field and sends that feedback as a create issue API request to Jira. This is how a user submitting the form leads to the successful creation of an issue based on the feedback given. All in a few lines of code, we've created a UI for a user to be able to submit feedback on a Confluence page and create a Jira issue in the relevant project. That's the kind of simple power we want to give app developers with Forge UI. So now we've seen how Forge UI uses the function component syntax to make it easy to render beautiful UI and enable useful interactions. But what we've explored so far still doesn't enable us to display UI conditionally. If you have a particularly keen eye, you may have noticed that the feedback collector macro that we saw at the beginning responded to the user submitting the form. Specifically, it responded by displaying a feedback submitted screen with a copy of the user's input. Let's explore how this is made possible with Forge UI. Local state is data persistence that lasts until the user refreshes the page which contained the app. We can use local state to implement a feedback submitted screen in our Confluence macro by keeping track of whether the user has submitted the form yet and storing the feedback that the user gave so that we can display it in our response. This is what the app developer's code might look like with the new requirement. We'll take the code from the previous example and extend it in three key ways. First, to facilitate the access and manipulation of this local state, we've introduced hooks. Hooks are special functions that enable us to access internal data such as local state. On the first invocation, we use the useState hook to set the feedback variable to be equal to the first argument of useState, which in this case is undefined. Then we conditionally render based on whether feedback is undefined. 
Because feedback is undefined on the first invocation, we show the form. If feedback isn't undefined, like we'll see later, then we would display the text component with the submitted feedback. So as we're familiar with by now, the user's device starts the process by invoking the serverless function. Then, because feedback was set to undefined, we return the form and text field as markup. This markup then gets transformed on the user's device into components that are displayed natively, and this slide is exactly the same as what we've seen before. But there is a bit more work currently hidden in this diagram that is required in order to facilitate local state. And that's because serverless functions are by definition stateless. They don't have access to any data except for what is passed into it and what it attempts to fetch from the outside world. So when a user fills in this form and clicks submit, and the serverless function is invoked a second time as a result, how does the new invocation know what the state of the app is? As you can see in this diagram, ForgeUI's solution to this is to send the app state back to the user's device alongside the markup. In our example, we return feedback as undefined along with our form and text field, and the app is then displayed as normal. The state is now stored locally on the user's device while we wait for the next time that the app needs to be invoked. As an aside, because the serverless function cannot maintain state in memory, the values stored in local state using the hooks must be JSON serializable. That means that while you can store primitives like numbers and strings and arrays and objects, more abstract language concepts with no reasonable JSON representation, such as functions, can't be stored. Okay, so we've got an app displaying like before. When the user fills it in and submits the form, a second invocation is triggered. We send the state along with the event data to the new invocation. Remember that the event data contains both information that identifies the corresponding event handler and the feedback that was input by the user. Being passed in the state means that when the app code is run, the framework knows that feedback was set to undefined before. In this somewhat contrived example, we don't use the previous state for anything particularly useful. But in reality, this mechanism of passing on previous state is vital for use cases such as persisting input data over multiple interactions or caching data retrieved from APIs. Using the event data passed in, the app knows to run the onSubmit event handler on the form. Within that handler, we still use the Jira API to create an issue with the feedback. But this time, we also take the second variable returned from the useState hook and call it as a function to set the feedback variable to store the user's input in the local app state. This then causes the function component to be rerun. And when it comes to determining what to return as markup, feedback is no longer undefined, so we return the text component instead. Going back to the diagram, our app code returns the text component as markup and the submitted feedback in state. And the markup is then displayed. We have a useful and beautiful user experience. In this way, a ForgeUI app at its simplest is a function that takes in some state and returns UI. Specifically, our code takes the local app state and returns markup. The team behind ForgeUI believe that this is a really intuitive way for you to be able to build apps and focus on what really matters to you. I've given you a broad overview of what goes on under the hood of ForgeUI, but our hope is that when you're building your own apps, you won't have to think about any of this. You won't need to know about how ForgeUI is architected or what is happening when the user clicks on the screen. ForgeUI handles all of this implementation detail that isn't relevant to your business need so that you can spend your time leveraging Forge to improve your work. In light of this, the last thing I want to take you through today is something a little more complex. We won't be thinking anymore about what ForgeUI is doing behind the scenes. Instead, I want to inspire you to think through the lens of what ForgeUI enables you to do. We've just looked at an example of ForgeUI used within a Confluence macro. One defining feature of Confluence macros is that each instance of a macro on a page can be configured. Specifically, data corresponding to each instance of the macro on a page can be manipulated in edit mode and stored persistently.
This is useful for apps which now enable users to configure the app depending on the use and context of a particular instance of the macro. Previously, for our Feedback Collector Confluence macro, we abstracted away some implementation details about the exact request body that was sent to Jira when the form was submitted. Specifically, we didn't specify the project that we wanted to create the issues in. We hid this behind a function called create issue post request. As you can see, in create issue post request, our value for project key has been hard coded in. This means that only users who want feedback collected in this specific Jira project are able to use this macro. What if the user of the macro wants to have their feedback tickets collected in a different project? That's where config comes in. We briefly touched on the macro component before, which wraps the app before we pass it into the ForgeUI render function. This macro component also accepts ForgeUI components passed into its config prop. We're going to use the config prop to supply a configuration form that users can access from inside the Confluence editor so that they can set up the feedback collector with their own Jira project. Let's display a config form with a text field for users to input their project key. We can add an is required prop to the text field so that the user can't submit the config form without filling in this field. And here you go, a configuration form that allows the user to determine a project key. When the user clicks save, this value will be persisted in the Confluence page's metadata itself. But this value doesn't necessarily do anything yet. Once the config data has been stored, how do we use it to determine where we create the Jira feedback issues? Going back to the config form code, remember that the text field has a name attribute. Just like in a normal ForgeUI form, the string passed into the name prop of the field becomes the key by which we access the submitted value. In the form used in the app itself, the submitted data was handled within the onSubmit event handler. For the data submitted using the config form, we access it using the ForgeUI useConfig hook. We'll actually use the useConfig hook to do two things. First, we can use it to prompt the user to configure the feedback collector app before it can be used. Second, we can access the user submitted project key to create the ticket. In our config form, we had a simple form with a project key text field. Here in our app code, we can reference the value that the user input into that project key text field by accessing the project key property on the config object, which is returned from the use config hook. So now, when a user uses our macro, they can individually configure each instance of the macro to create issues in different Jira projects. This is a pretty good experience, but how might we improve this a little more? Well, with a text field, it's pretty easy to enter an invalid project key. Perhaps the user might accidentally miss a character. To avoid this, why don't we fetch the available projects from Jira and allow the user to select from the available project keys? Function components can't be asynchronous, so instead we use the useState hook, which accepts an async function as its initial state argument, to fetch the Jira projects list and store it in the projects variable. Again, I've abstracted away the details of the exact Jira API request here, but essentially it's a simple get request for a list of all the projects in the current Jira instance. We then take the list of projects and map them into the options of a ForgeUI select component. Our final product is a feedback collector confluence macro, which allows users to easily configure each instance of the macro to create feedback issues in the relevant Jira project. Users are even able to browse through the select drop-down menu if they don't have a project in mind. Macro configuration enables app developers to use ForgeUI to easily create flexible, custom user experiences in the Confluence editor. But the Confluence macro is just one possible ForgeUI extension point. Absolutely. Let's run through what you can get started with today. As Kang just showed you, you can use macros in Confluence right now. Soon, you'll also be able to work with the Content Actions menu, which lets you run all kinds of extension points that take the whole page as an input. You'll also be able to work with context menus, which can take a segment of highlighted text and perform an action on it. In Jira, right now you're able to get started with issue glances, which show up in the sidebar of an issues view 
They let you summarize all sorts of information about an issue in an easy to reach place. And you can also work with issue panels, which appear in the main body of an issue's view and do much the same thing. Finally, we support workflow validators, which allow you to run custom code when transitioning an issue between statuses in a JIRA board. We're looking at dramatically increasing the number of extension points going forward, which will let you integrate all sorts of never before seen experiences into Atlassian's cloud apps with Forge UI. In the future, we're also looking at expanding to more products and maybe even more platforms. But all of this depends on you. The best way to let us know what you'd like to build with Forge is to get started now. You can do that by heading to atlassian.com forge and joining the Forge beta waitlist. There's a lot of really great stuff to play around with and we're watching eagerly to see what you make with it. Thanks and have a great remote summit.